So today I'm going to be making a short, brief, pretty brief video documentary on obsessive compulsive disorder. So just to give a little bit of background information about OCD. Um, so OCD typically has like an onset in early adolescence or early adulthood. And since that onset takes place during that time, like consultation for the disorder and initiation of treatment is typically delayed because people may not realize that they need to seek help for their condition until later. Um, and it consists of obsessions and compulsions. So obsessions are recurrent thoughts that are anxiety inducing, that are constant and can, are only relieved temporarily by compulsions which are repetitive actions or like thought patterns that diminish the anxiety that is caused by the obsessions. So now getting into a little bit of the history of OCD. So until about the 1850s, OCD was considered to be insanity and then a shift around 1850 occurred where OCD became its own disease um, as first as like a part of neurosis and then it was briefly deemed a psychotic disorder and then it became the newly defined neurosis or part of neurosis as defined post 1880s. And then after 1860, the cause of OCD was suggested to be a dysfunction in the autonomic nervous system and the cortical blood supply. And the psychological hypothesis around that time were that um, OCD was caused by volitional, emotional, or intellectual disability or impairment. But the emotional impairment part of that is what became dominant after 1890. And then just a little bit of DSM background. So DSM for TR classifies OCD as an anxiety disorder although some clinicians conceptualize it as a spectrum of related disorders. And there are um, obsessive compulsive related disorders in the DSM now, I believe. And then the prevalence rate worldwide for OCD is about one to 3%, but it is slightly more pre prevalent in developed countries at two to 3%. And the World Health Organization lists OCD among the group of disorders with the highest disabling, with the highest rate of disability, which is really interesting to me because that's not something that I really knew about OCD. I wasn't aware of how disabling it can be for people. So, the um, so now getting into some treatment options. Really, the two main treatment options for OCD are cognitive behavioral therapy and SSRIs, which are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And those are obviously a medication. So in terms of what CBT looks like for people with OCD, it normally refers to exposure therapy, exposure therapy with response prevention or just cognitive therapy, or there can be a combination of both of those being used to treat. And in Germany, I thought this was very interesting. There's actually inpatient treatment available for OCD for people that have like the most severe treatment resistant cases. And then another thing to note about OCD is that people, many people with OCD have other disorders that are com comorbid with it. And in a study of 112 children and adolescents that were aged eight to 18, 67% of them had one comorbid disorder, 20.5% 20, 20 had two comorbidities and 2.6 had three. So, and then the group of patients with a comorbid diagnosis of a neurodevelopmental disorder had significantly more family history of OCD, which I thought was really interesting. And that group showed a predominance of males. And then in terms of some diagnosis, this is a really interesting thing that I didn't know is that neuroimaging can be used to diagnose OCD. So neuroimaging studies from the 1980s show, showed that people with OCD's brains are different from their healthy counterparts. 
and these found that there's hyperactivity in the prefrontal cortex, anterior cingulate cortex, and caudate nucleus of the brain. And in the last two decades, imaging has suggested that there are more parts of the brain involved, like the parietal cortex, the limbic areas, or the amygdala, and the cerebellum, which is like very interesting to me that so many different parts of the brain can influence OCD, which is not something that I was really aware of before researching OCD. Okay, and then in terms of the etiology, um, it has been found that heredity plays a pretty large role in OCD etiology, and the evidence for this comes from several methodological approaches like family studies, twin studies, and segregation analysis studies. And then there has also been some other research that suggests that a dysfunction in the orbitofrontal subcortical circuitry is what underlines the etiology of OCD, so that's more neurochemical and brain functioning, which is really interesting. And then more about the etiology from a psychological perspective, cognitive behavioral models suggest that like the shared environment or parenting style is important to the etiology of OCD. And then in, an, in the same study, genetic effects and non-shared environment were shown to be the most influential, influential in the variance of symptoms. So that was really interesting. So the non-shared environment had more of an impact on variance of symptoms, which I think makes more sense considering the more different the non-shared experience, their symptoms would present differently. I think that makes sense. And the variance due to non-shared environment also increased with age, which I thought was interesting. And then in terms of prognosis, um, when looking at pediatric OCD, according to a meta-analysis of 18 studies about remission, and f that found that the pooled remission rate of all of those participants in the study was 62%, which I think is pretty good. And the authors in that study noted that the outcome of pediatric OCD is getting a lot better than it used to be, which is a good thing. And then in terms of long-term outcomes, so this is like 10 plus years after diagnosis, one study found that 71% of patients met criteria for some psychiatric disorder after being diagnosed. Wow, 36% was still suffering from OCD. And this was with a mean follow-up time of 11.2 years and the mean age at onset was 12 and a half. So overall, having 36% of the participants still struggling with OCD about 11 years later, I think that is pretty hopeful because that's less than half still struggling. I think that would mean that there is some hope that you're not going to have this lifelong issue of OCD. And then in terms of like the biblical perspective, so some in the Christian world argue that OCD is a worship problem and that in order to get better or be relieved from your OCD, you have to shift what you're worshiping, which would be your obsessions and your compulsions. You have to shift what, what that is tied to, to worshiping God, which to me doesn't seem like a valid treatment program or something that makes a whole lot of sense. And then another perspective from the Christians would be that committing the unpardonable, committing the unpardonable sin is um, something that is a component of OCD. So this would mean like doing something that you cannot be forgiven from not being able to go to heaven because of your compulsions and things like that. And then there also is a subtype of OCD that deals specifically with religious and moral obsessions and it's called scrupulosity OCD, which I did not know that existed. So it was very interesting to find out. And then the most important thing for a Christian to remember when a Christian with OCD to remember is that their obsessions and compulsions are not sins or at least their obsessions are not sins. And then one thing that this article also mentioned 
is that ERP therapy. So one of the most viable treatments for Christians with OCD would be exposure with response prevention therapy. That's one thing this article noted as well. So overall, though, that's the information that I have to share about obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, so yeah, thank you for listening.